One year ago, a store clerk called Minneapolis police after a customer paid for a pack of cigarettes with a fake $20 bill. What happened next changed us. The murder of George Floyd ignited a reckoning on race, policing, and equality. Demonstrators flooded the streets here and around the world. For the next hour, we're going to focus on those turning the power of protest into meaningful change. But first, Kent Erdahl shows us how we got here. George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd. George Floyd. There is a power in his name that continues to resonate from a Minneapolis intersection to a worldwide movement. Say his name! We know his story will be part of our history, but what part will we play? On the ground. On May 25, 2020, his death seemed destined to be downplayed and overlooked. We do believe that this is a uh, medical incident. They will kill me, man. Until a teenager refused to look away turning her lens on those in power while never losing sight of his humanity. He stopped calling his mama name, mama, mama, mama. And that's when he stopped talking. Within hours, we were all witnesses to a murder. And our emotions, actions, and reactions were raw and wide ranging. It was the worst thing I'd ever seen. Depending on the lenses through which we each view the world. I pray that we never become a victim of what George has been through. For some, it reinforced fears of a lived experience. Every time I step out of the house, I understand why my mother gets, she's afraid every single time. For others. Painting a mural for George Floyd's memory. It forced a painful new perspective. We feel so helpless by, by you know, the life that was taken away from us um, and a system that feels so big and scary and out of our control. Scary and out of control also describes the week that followed. On Tuesday, the chief fired all four officers. We were on fire. Two days later, a group set fire to a police precinct and the chaos became a cycle. <laughs> Peaceful marches splintered and devolved at night, blurring lines between righteous anger and rioting. This was a piece of protest. Now everybody, now it's on fire, buildings are broke, people's lives are ruined. In response, leaders called in more officers and National Guard to gain control. Go, 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 go. Blurring lines between public safety and police state. Some suffered life-altering injuries. Others had livelihoods destroyed. This is not justice. But each morning, Minnesotans got back up to pick up and found they weren't alone. Okay, you see things that are burnt down right now. Right now, we're out here feeding people that can't go grocery shopping. Do you want a water? Volunteers arrived and donations poured in from around the world to help rebuild and restock the cupboards of countless families. If you really want things to change, then you need to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself how you can help make it better instead of just judging what's happening. But the right answers aren't always clear. This council is going to dismantle this police department. Do we defund and dismantle or reform and reimagine? I feel sad, but then I don't understand. And will we? Why the cops killed him? Show the next generation that we can learn from the past. I understand you have a verdict. To change the future. State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin. One thing Court, is certain. Verdict. Count one. We know accountability is possible. Find the defendant guilty. Thank you, Jesus! About damn time! Last month's trial marked a powerful shift. We gotta stop killing our babies. I mean, nothing can bring George Floyd back, but at least this is a huge step towards racial justice. History will remember that day and his name. But what will it say? about what happens next. The Twin Cities, we're ground zero in a national conversation, in fact, a global conversation about uh, racial justice. And that's important, and it's going to mark our future. Well, today, a flurry of gunfire erupted near 38th and Chicago, injuring one person and shaking up those who had gathered there, including many national and international news crews, some of whom were live on the air when that gunfire erupted. The group of neighbors holding space for nearly a year at George Floyd Square don't want that moment to overshadow the work. They know change is hard. They know more needs to be done. Devon Raming met with them to listen to their hopes for the future.
38th in Chicago. Tragedy to triumph. A sacred space for justice, healing, and change after the death of George Floyd. How do you stand in your truth? How do you demand the change you need to see? Reflection and expression taking hold then and now. It's nothing but genuine love just being in the space. Feeling grief, sharing grief. Seeing the imagination and creativity of the community really grow and develop. Bringing to life a new sense of community. Community is the answer to racism. It is. And, and getting to know people and getting to know who they are and connecting with them. I didn't know any of my neighbors before this and now I know them all and I feel so much safer because we take care of each other. Um, and I didn't have that before. This neighborhood is no stranger to change. I've lived here a little over 30 years and the neighborhood's been really stable um, for, for that whole time in both good ways and bad ways. This is an area that have been historically overpromised and underdelivered. But this time around. When this took place, it was an opportunity to change the narrative. The caretakers of change are from within. Allowing us to overserve and underserve community. It's a blessing to have a community that it helps you out with anything. Offering free food, clothes, and health services, giving people a place to belong. This is not an autonomous zone. What we're trying to do, it excludes no one. We are creating the world we want to live in every single day in this space. This stand that we're making is for liberation. It is for justice. It is to get something for black folks, brown folks, indigenous folks who have suffered historically in this city. We know what we need, we know what we want, we know what we need to do from a, a cultural aspect. It's a community at a crossroads too. The future of 38th in Chicago remains uncertain and a reopening brings concerns and challenges. People are more concerned about a plan to reopen the streets than they are concerned about a plan to help the people. As that conversation continues. So we're gonna continue to work on our people, we're gonna continue to work on our youth, we're gonna continue to work on our community. We demand nothing less and we work for nothing less than a better world for the youth for the for seven generations afterwards. We don't want them to be fighting the same battles that we're fighting today. A promise to community and the history that shaped them. When yellow school buses drop off children to come see this site decades from now, everyone who has been here they will know what we stood for and what we continue to stand for here at George Floyd Square. Well, the group has sent the city a resolution with a list of 24 demands they want to see fulfilled before the streets are opened. Another proposal calls for the creation of a memorial at the intersection that would still allow traffic to flow through. Well, just today, the family of George Floyd announced they will be awarding $500,000 in grants to businesses and organizations in the area around 38th and Chicago. Floyd's family says they hope these grants will encourage the success and growth of black citizens and community of harmony. For information on how to apply, you can go to care11.com slash power to change. In downtown Minneapolis, the George Floyd Foundation hosted a moment of silence and celebration of life. Floyd's sister, Bridget Floyd, said the public gatherings marking her brother's death are beautiful and something he would have been a part of if the victim had been someone else. They would never forget George Floyd's name because I would not allow them to. And I'm not just fighting for George Floyd, I'm fighting for other families that has lost their loved ones. And I am uh, continuing to do things through the George Floyd Memorial Foundation for others. Our door is open to anyone that needs our, our help and support. We're here. Well, days after Floyd's death, calls to defund the Minneapolis Police Department started spreading, an approach that has caused controversy and division. A year later, the relationship between police and some residents remains tense. At the same time, violence has spiked and the department is facing staffing shortages. But as Lou Ragu shows us, the city has made some policy changes, hoping to build trust. 
Protesters have called for the defunding of police before, but after the death of George Floyd, it became a very real possibility. This council is going to dismantle this police department. The Minneapolis City Council unveiled a plan to remake MPD and approach public safety very differently. Public health approach to public safety treats violence as a contagious disease. And like any other infectious disease, it can be prevented and treated. Mayor Jacob Fry did not agree with that approach. Absolutely for a massive shift, a structural shift in how the police department functions. I'll say it again. Uh, am I for ab abolishing the entire police department? No, I'm not, and I'll be honest about that too. While the plan to dismantle MPD has not been put before voters yet, Mayor Fry and Chief Madera Arredondo made several changes to MPD policy over the past year since Floyd was killed. And that's everything from overhauling our use of force policy to make it as stringent as possible under state law to embedding a city attorney uh, in the disciplinary process, making sure that these disciplinary actions are expedited uh, as much as possible. Specific policy reforms include a duty for officers to intervene verbally and physically if they see another officer use inappropriate force, and a duty to immediately report it, a ban on chokeholds and neck restraints, a ban on officers reviewing body camera footage prior to completing initial police reports, a ban on officers in critical incidents talking to union officials at the crime scene, mandated de-escalation efforts prior to use of force, with a requirement to document those efforts. More body camera policy changes, including banning officers from turning off cameras during private conversations at an incident scene, and restrictions on who can use less lethal munitions like tear gas and rubber bullets and when they can be used. Those were changes perhaps that were overdue, uh, but the particular moment uh, allowed us to push a whole lot of things forward in quick progression. More than 200 MPD officers have left the department since George Floyd was killed, and violent crime in the city has gone up. Those are factors that make reforms trickier and create more disagreement on the best way to handle it. Every idea and every change is met with controversy and criticism. I believe in deep structural change to how our police department operates. I think what people are looking for right now is a level of authenticity a level of honesty about the situations that we're dealing with, and specificity as well. Changes at other departments are now occurring much faster as well. Brooklyn Center City Council just passed a resolution creating an unarmed traffic enforcement division and mental health community response department just weeks after the death of Dante Wright. The defund and dismantle movement in Minneapolis has not gone away. Voters will likely get a chance to decide on the future of policing for themselves if the question makes it to the November ballot. On that same ballot, voters will have a chance to weigh in on the future of the leadership of the city, as Mayor Fry and the city council members are all up for re-election. Well, Chief Arredondo declined an interview, and City Council Public Safety Chair Philippe Cunningham did not respond to our request for an interview. Governor Tim Walz has also called for police reform. In a tweet today, he wrote, we must honor George Floyd's memory here in Minnesota by ensuring all people are respected and protected by law enforcement. The governor also said this goes beyond policing when we spoke with him last week. I'm making the case, especially around um, those reforms that they're making, there's a broader equity issue. There's equity in our schools. There's equity in business ownership. There's equity in home ownership. I think we would be remiss if we didn't use this at a time right now to, to make center equity, center the opportunity for all Minnesotans. In D.C. today, George Floyd's family met privately with President Joe Biden. Afterward, they addressed the media, saying the president assured them he won't be happy with a watered-down version of the George Floyd justice in policing bill. He showed um, concern, and um, I think genuinely he wanted to know exactly how we were doing and on what he could do to support us. And he did let us know that he supports passing the bill, but he wants to make sure that it's the right bill and not a rush bill. This is the thing. If you can make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, you can make federal laws to protect people of color. The family also met with both Republican and Democratic lawmakers on Capitol Hill. President Biden had hoped the bill would be passed by Congress today. While it did not make his deadline, the legislation is still expected to move forward this week. Well, at the root of all these topics is systemic racism. Next, we'll peel back the layers one by one. One very visible example is the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. How the community is building back after its destruction 50 years later. We have so much power in this moment to be part of the vanguard of what a new America looks like. 
Then noted scholar of the civil rights and black power movement, Dr. Yahiro Williams shares his thoughts on what we've learned and how we move forward. This is a live look at Say Their Name Cemetery on 37th Street in Minneapolis, where people have come to pay their respects to those who have died after encounters with police. A candlelight vigil will begin shortly at eight o'clock in front of Cup Foods. Systemic racism, disparities, and inequality are at the root of the issues we face, and there is data to prove it. Gia Vang breaks down the numbers so that we can start to do better. To understand the fight against systemic racism and inequality, you have to understand the numbers. Let's start with income. It's a major predictor for the challenges and obstacles to come. A black family in Minnesota earns about $38,000 a year. That's less than half of the average income of a white family, making it the second biggest income gap in the nation. That impacts housing. Minneapolis has the largest gap between black and white home ownership rates in the United States. While about three quarters of white families own homes, only about one quarter of black families do. Black renters spend a significantly larger portion of their income on rent compared to any other group. As for jobs, the unemployment rate for black Minnesotans is double the rate for white Minnesotans. With fewer employment opportunities, there are fewer chances to get health insurance, which leads to more unchecked health issues. Diabetes, heart disease, and mortality rates are higher among people of color and of lower socioeconomic status. So what about education as a way towards better job opportunities? Well, we have one of the nation's worst education achievement gaps on everything from graduation rates, test scores, reading and math, poverty, unstable housing, unemployment, poor health, lack of education. That leads to an incarceration rate of black Minnesotans that is 11 times that of white Minnesotans. Black people make up less than 6% of the state's population, but make up 35% of the prison population. The numbers, knowing and understanding them, leads to conversations, to change, to envision better. Well, George Floyd's death shined a light on past injustices, and for the Rondo community, it hit close to home. The construction of I-94 destroyed a community and tore families apart. Charmé Nero shares what justice means for them. Depending on where you're from, justice can mean many things. Justice in, in the Rondo community is an opportunity. It's just giving me an equal opportunity to live, to work, to enjoy, to live free of fear. We would walk all the way down and stop here, here, here. For 81-year-old Marvin Anderson, the well-known and well-loved keeper of history in St. Paul's Rondo neighborhood. This is the nation's first memorial park dedicated to a community that was destroyed by freeway construction. One form of justice comes by reuniting a once thriving, predominantly black community destroyed by highway construction in the late 1950s and early 60s. Right through Rondo Avenue, described by Anderson as the community's heart. When we looked out of our homes that were still standing and you lost all of these touch points, points that really regulated your life in a way. To build a highway, more than 700 family homes were destroyed and 300 businesses were forced to close or torn down. At the time, 80% of St. Paul's African-American population called Rondo home. The community was gutted, leaving those who stayed behind longing for what once existed beneath the pavement. The problems of America, these things that have been going on for so long, are in the basement of America that we don't go down there as much as we should. This is a real issue. This is not a black issue, this is a human issue. It's not special treatment, it's not extra things, it's just justice and not being afraid to live and be in your community. Hands up! As America faced yet another tragedy last May, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. The green was the route it should have gone. This is the actual route. This is the one that goes through the Rondo community. Executive Director Jonathan Palmer with the Hallie Q. Brown Community Center. 
says the protest and aftermath felt across the country forced people to ask the question, what can we do to spark change? Working with communities to help them understand what systemic racism is, what the impact is. This is something that has been a long time coming. It is something that is necessary for us to move ahead. It's more than a neighborhood. I like to say Rhonda was an organism. As Anderson looks toward a land bridge project that will reconnect the Rondo community, he's always known and loved. He says justice comes in many forms when you look beyond the pavement to right the wrongs from the past. George Floyd and all of these African-American men whose lives had been taken, to me, have shined a collective light on the basements of America. That's where the mold is. That's where the foundation is sinking. But you have to be able to see that in order to make the changes. Being able to see the wrongs of the past allows us to walk toward making things right. Jana sat down with Dr. Yohuru Williams, the founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas. Waking up to this day meant looking back to this day one year ago. When you woke up this morning on May 25th, a year later, what went through your mind? Oddly enough, I remember the rain after the day after, I remember that, that terrible rain and it was a young girl on the news and she was asking in a way that I thought was really powerful, why does this continue to happen and why do they keep killing us? Uh, and a year later, I think we're still asking that question and, and variations of that question. The question has been asked plainly and the question has been asked in more nuanced ways. Black lives, they matter here. In terms of the pathways to inequality within the systems of this country. You know, the United States is in a is in an interesting place right now. We have a lot of work to do and a long way to go before we've dealt with in a substantive way these issues of racial inequality in housing and education and health care and certainly in policing. State of Minnesota plaintiff versus Derek Michael Chauvin. And those are conversations that aren't marked by one day. Thank you, Jesus. They are earmarked to be the questions of our time. I'm fond of saying we are on the jury and ultimately we get to determine what the future of our community is. So what's our decision going forward? We have so much power in this moment to be part of the vanguard of what a new America looks like. An America that lives up to its promise with liberty and justice for all, not just justice in one courtroom. We really have to commit ourselves in a deep way to continuing to stay engaged. And that means for white and black people, for every shade in between, recognizing that we as individuals, and we shared this when we were going through the trial, are the jury. Um, the real trial is of this community. Here we are today, and so many people at the conclusion of the trial and everything that's happened just want this to be finished. Chauvin went to prison. It's over. What do you say to them? We can't afford in this moment another unfinished revolution. If we think about the history of the United States, the end of Reconstruction in 1877 was an unfinished revolution. Tremendous opportunity in that moment to push through legislation to create absolute equality before the law for African Americans. And it fails because of a lack of political will. Do you ever feel like you're pushing a rock up a hill, Dr. Williams? every day, but I think it's a good rock to push up the hill. I think one of the things that encourages me is that there are so many people pushing with us now. And I think one of the reasons that I have so much optimism about this community and one of the reasons that I feel so encouraged is that I believe that this is a turning point. From May 25th of 2020 to what May 25th is right now. We should think about May 25th in some sense as our new birthday. Uh, for the Twin Cities, an opportunity for us to be leaders in a space where this tragedy should galvanize us to think about what we can do to make um, you know, the community better, but ultimately to make our world a better place. Speaking of the future, how the movement moves forward will be in the hands of young people. We get their thoughts next. And a look at some new community programs hoping to help in the healing. Community activists are hard at work cultivating the many ways there are to heal. Everything from a performance stage to a rural farm. They're two things that might seem very different, but as Jennifer Hoff reports, they have one goal in mind. On a warm Wednesday afternoon, 
Ashley Henderson's energy is as bright as the sun. It's her job to help others feel that light after some really dark days. The 30-year-old comedian hosting a free show at Sammy's Avenue Eatery in North Minneapolis. Laughter is truly medicine to the soul. And I think um, in the African-American community, we have found comfort in laughing at our pain. The pain from George Floyd's death still palpable. But so is Henderson's motivation to help her community heal, just like she did in the days after the riots. I'm like, yo, we don't have a grocery store. Like, we're going to need something, too. She organized the Northside Emergency Resource Pop-Up right across the street from Sammy's, full of donated goods given away for free. We fed over 8,000 people off an idea of just saying we had to replace Cub Foods. If laughter is the best medicine, then education is a tool for healing. And Leslie E. Redmond has the biggest box to put it in. The founder of Don't Complain, Activate, Redmond is revamping this RV into a resource center for the community, a cultural center by day, transitional housing for one person at a time at night. Young people sometimes need a place to sleep. They need a place to shower. They might need a place to wash their clothes. They might need food. They might need clothes. They might need books and resources, right? And so we're really doing wraparound services like I've never seen done before. The former NAACP president turned lawyer also giving away learning kits to teach families black history along with other donations with hopes of making her mobile dream a reality by June. But I believe that we can heal in so many ways and education is healing. Looking back is what pushes them forward. Pictures, a reminder of the people who flocked to what's now George Floyd Square after his murder, like Bryant Jones. Yeah, we'd like to think that we're fostering um, peace. He cooked for the crowd, sometimes 20 hours a day, and it was then he had an idea that just keeps sprouting. I'm not necessarily a cook, even though I'm good at this, but how can I bring plants and what I'm trained to do, you know, into a cause that I'm um, dedicated to. The University of Minnesota plant science major had a hand in harvesting a garden and cultivating community. He's a co-founder of the group Twin Cities Relief Initiative that feeds families. In the first 42 days following Floyd's death, Jones said they served a thousand people a day and they're still giving back using the naturally hot pavement and trapped stormwater to grow their own crops. By no means are we where we need to be, but it's, it's a good start. Where there's growth comes healing, and only then can people truly thrive. <laughs> From community garden to farm field, Twin Cities Relief is expanding. 50 miles from home. I think people need space to heal. Part of Vanessa Martinson's property, now part of their plan to turn her farm into outdoor classrooms. And for the group's other founder, it's a movement that goes far beyond food. We want to be able to, to feed people, but we want to be able to teach them how to feed themselves too. From carpentry to mechanics, landscaping to skin care, the land will provide a more sustainable future. While George Floyd is rooted in community, now crossing county lines. The healing comes from having opportunities of more, having outlets for what can I do now, um, being able to put money in their pockets, giving them trades that can give them opportunities off the streets. To have this momentum and all these people, like that's where it feels, feels so different. After George Floyd's murder, Minneapolis young people made their voices heard. Heidi Wigdahl spoke to a few students about the support they received and what their hope is moving forward. Speak up and stand by the communities who need it. For the past year, as people protested racial injustice, <laughs> the youth have been front and center. Or show the schools that our lives matter for the education right now. Speaking their minds. When they like kill one of us black people, because as a black person, they can't trust police officers to uh to come out and protect us as they say they're going to do. Xavier Douglas, an eighth grader at Hiawatha College Prep, says after George Floyd's murder, his teachers talked to them about what happened. Yeah, yeah, it helped. It helped. Yes, counselors reached out to students to just make sure everyone was being, like, had the resources to cope with everything. Nora Francois, a Minnetonka High School senior, says education around this historic moment is important. For students to have accurate descriptions of these events is so important for the future generations to understand how George changed the world. 
The youth are now helping plant seeds for growth and change. These issues are so apparent in our lives that there's no longer um, a way we can separate um, social justice or what's going on in the world to our work, our school, and our personal lives. Liz Balsoni, a sophomore at St. Catherine University, says mental health has also become a priority. A lot of times those are things we aren't comfortable talking about in a classroom setting, in a workplace, and that just can't be the case anymore because we can't, without our best, healthiest, and um, most empowered selves, we can't be productive. The nonprofit The Real Minneapolis has spent the past year supporting kids through its Hope Youth Center. Allowing them to be free and open and talk about their feelings, but also to be able to run around outside and just be a kid. It's so important right now. Co-founder Valerie Quintana says they'll be offering a free summer program for kids ages eight and up. This is the beginning and we need to just keep doing the hard work. Now that our our community has seen justice. We have a taste for it now and we're not going to stop fighting for our brothers and sisters who have lost their lives. We just got we just got to hope and just keep our just keep praying. Hope Youth Center summer program starts June 14th. It is free for children eight and up. It will include everything from photography and cooking classes to community health sessions and professional therapists. We have a link to sign up at care11.com. In the past year, faith leaders have been doing a lot of heavy lifting. We talked with some of them about the spiritual work ahead. I said, George, we're sad to lose you. But what you did was to sacrifice for us. And civil rights icon Dr. Josie Johnson shares her thoughts with us next. Through this tumultuous year, many have leaned into their faith, and a younger generation of faith leaders now believe their role requires more than just spiritual guidance. The afternoon of the verdict announcement, Pastor Jalila Abdul-Brown was downtown with the people. I went outside to see uh, what was the temperature of the city. People were so elated. I saw Black Lives Matter signs being waved, and it really made a lot of people of color, it made us feel human. But the intense feelings of joy from that day do not overcast any of the other days for Pastor Jay. Every day I wake up with a mindset that today it's gonna be different, today is a new day to make changes, and today is the day I'm gonna see the change. Action, it's what drives her. She says it's what young people value right now in a young faith leader. One thing I've noticed about young people, they pay more attention to what you do versus what you say. And so being a leader on the front lines, whether it's the faith community or anything you're trying to get anybody to be a part of, it has to first work for you. And being that they see that my faith works for me, it makes other young people believe in my faith without me having to do a lot of talking. Mm. But does that exhaust you? Because you're out there every single day. It doesn't exhaust me because I am inspired and I am passionate about what I do. I am passionate about seeing lives change. Um, as a little girl, I didn't have any food to eat. So I know what it means to be left behind. I know what it means to go through trauma. So what I do is I share my story and then I get to work. The core to being the core in a community turns out is a whole lot of storytelling. How do you give up the vibes that you're here to listen and you are to be trusted. Uh, what I like to say is number one, you gotta show up as your authentic self. And I like to say we do a story for a story, right? And that's just uh, the narrative storytelling, saying that, hey, I'll tell you my story if you tell me your story. And authenticity and trust always come in step. Trauma is first heard, then acknowledged. The first lens we gotta look through is a racial-based lens. People of color in the state of Minnesota have been left behind. We know that it's I'm done talking, I'm ready to get to work. You cannot make decisions for the African American community, the Native American community, the Asian and Pacific Island community without us. We need to be at these tables so that we can let you know what we wanna see in our communities, what we wanna see in our families, and then what we wanna see in generations to come. I'm very curious what you pray about at night before going to bed. Um, what I pray about is safety. Mm. I pray about safety. I find myself praying about safety a lot. And then uh, the youth in the community, I find myself praying uh, for hope 
for safety, for protection of the next generation, and then also of the leaders in this city. I'm constantly praying for leaders in this city because without prayer, I don't feel like leaders can thrive. We need to be praying for our mayor. We need to be praying for our governor. We need to be praying for the people that are in these key positions to make change if we're going to see change. At 90 years old, Dr. Josie Johnson has been witness to many pivotal moments in American history, and she's played a role in much of it as well. Johnson is an icon, fighting for civil rights since the 1950s. She's also an author and educator, and the first African-American to serve on the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents. We asked her for her thoughts on what's happening now. I'm hopeful. I'm not 100% convinced because the history that's been taught about us is everywhere, in books, in movies, in stories. So it's hard for many to really hear clearly what's being said. And the image is so powerful of what's been printed and reported about us. So I'm looking forward with a sense of hope that the image will remain in the minds and hearts of people. They don't forget. And I believe that this moment in our history where we've had to really be isolated and spend a little more time thinking, reading, studying, trying to assess what's going on in our society, that that has given us an opportunity, I believe, to help create a society that we want in America. And one way to do that is to offer children of color more opportunities to succeed. A local camp is making sure local young people have as many choices as possible. That story's coming up next. This is a live look at George Floyd Square, where all walks of life have come to honor his memory. A candlelight vigil will begin shortly at eight o'clock. Well, the founders of a Minneapolis nonprofit were just getting started with their initiatives when George Floyd's murder led them to reevaluate their plans. Now, as Kaya Edwards shows us, their mission is coming full circle. At a park not two miles away from George Floyd Square, the adults on the field reunite with Devontae White Sledge. I play for Patrick Henry. An energetic and charming high school freshman. QB1, you know, don't need to brag, but uh, you know, varsity. Within minutes, a young onlooker no one knew before. This is what we do. Joins them. Got the new kids now. Kyle Skye and Daryl White host free arts and athletics camps for inner city youth. Football camp, basketball camp, music or film. Through their nonprofit, the Bay Laurel Fund. We also introduce these kids to career opportunities. An example I love to use is if you're extremely passionate about basketball, but unfortunately you're five foot zero and your jump shot is terrible, you might not make it to the, the NBA. But if you're great at math, did you know that you could be a statistician? We seek out people of color that are working in these career paths and we invite them to our camps to speak to the kids and basically just say like, you know, I'm doing this and you can do it too. Exactly, and it's something that, you know, we wish somebody would have really told us when we were younger. The information is not lost on Devante. He's been to their camps. Daryl was talking to me about like, everybody don't make it to the league, so there's other things you can do, you know, like athletic training. They don't teach you that stuff in school. Bay Laurel teach you stuff that you know, that'll really carry on in life. As well as technical skills. Everybody know I play sports, but a lot of people don't know I'm into music. Now at the Bay Laurel camp, I learned how to make my own logo. I learned how to make beats. You know, I learned how to write the right way instead of just, you know, throwing words down on the notebook, actually, you know, thinking it through and making it make sense. But after only about a year as an official 501c3, Kyle and Daryl found themselves putting this important work on hold. With COVID, 
we just didn't want to take the risk. But really, their work was not done. When the George Floyd situation happened, it gave us an opportunity to kind of pivot our focus and directly impact people on a different scale. To see what was happening to the community, it was super heartbreaking. People are, you know, looking at us as, as leaders in the community. Why not? Let's go do something about it. We made a campaign called the Minneapolis Rebuild Campaign and we raised a little over $20,000 in total. London, Copenhagen, Australia, from all over. With those resources that we were fortunate enough to have donated to us, we gave directly to the people. We also donated to some small businesses that had been looted to help them get back on their feet. And Bay Laurel's work will never be done. That saying, never rest on your laurels, what that means is regardless of how many times you achieve victory, you never settle on that. What happened to George Floyd is, is sick. You know, it's, it's hard and we want to be able to shift back to more positivity in, in any way that we possibly can and the camps is a great place for us to start. This is America. You can run for office. You can change the laws. You just have to know that that's a possibility. And that's one thing that we're going to definitely focus and make sure that we implement into our programming. But at the same time, we're going to make sure that these kids have fun. You can find out more about Bay Laurel and all the organizations featured tonight at care11.com slash power to change. Next, we went to all corners of our community to ask, how has this past year and what happened to George Floyd changed you? The past year has shown us that change is possible, but we know it's hard too. It takes having difficult conversations, it takes commitment, it takes understanding. Thank you for joining us tonight. We leave you with Boyd Hoopert and the question, how did George Floyd change you? George Floyd changed the world. It's the promise of 38th in Chicago. I'm more hopeful today than ever. The promise of George's memorial service. You changed the world, George. But did George Floyd's murder change us? I feel like as a community here in Hudson, it changed us in that it started a lot of conversations that I don't think were happening before. Susie Higgles runs Joe to Go Coffee with wife Jess. Here you are. It made me definitely stop pretending that, that I don't have white privilege, because I absolutely do. The concrete evidence of having a beginning to end video documentation of the murder that happened by a police officer erases any issue of doubt as to whether or not this exists. I feel like there has been a global shift. It changed not only me, all the society or around me. But the changes Ramadan Mohammed feels are not for the better. The police are killing you on the street for very small mistake. He finds himself worrying more for his four children. <sighs> Sometimes, you know, it makes me emotional. I am worried because I don't want my son to grow in this environment that we are already in, you know? I want this thing to be changed. Change. Yeah, I think it's changed us. I think it's forced us to recognize the injustices that are all around us. Tiffany and Scott Glim have brought their family for a third time to 38th and Chicago, including nine-year-old Bella. We talked about it a lot at the dinner table. Our church has taken more active stances in you know, social justice issues and that, and I'm right in there helping them out with that. Um, something that would have been totally out of my comfort zone a year ago. When I watched the video, I cried because I felt so bad. Like, I felt so bad when he's literally saying, I can't breathe. But a year later, have things changed for Bell Fulton? But it's still crazy. It's still crazy out here. A lot of people don't, don't want to change. Great, sounds good. Yeah. The TV on which the trial aired every day is now back to regular programming at Carolyn Smaller's flower shop. She wants to believe in change. You know, I'm up there in age, I've seen a lot happen, and nothing has ever changed. We'll have to wait and see. Waiting and hoping. 
for change.